All right, welcome back. Now we're going to talk about obsessive compulsive disorder and PTSD, the parts that I recorded earlier, but without this amazing hairdo, which I'm doing for my stats class. Um, but no audio happened. So anyway, let's uh, let's switch over to that and begin this and try and make it not too long. And that, that would be kind of nice, I think. So let me just make sure this is, looks like it's recording at least. It looks like it. We'll see. All right, obsessive compulsive disorder, one of the things you should know about that is that it's not clear that obsessive disorder, compulsive disorder should actually be classified as an anxiety disorder. There are researchers out there who think that OCD, quite a number of them, who think that OCD should be its own thing, that it shouldn't be, that it's not really an anxiety disorder at all. So OCD, uh, let me see if I make sure I'm focused on the right window. Um, obsessive compulsive disorder, first of all, just listing the criteria. You need obsessions and you need compulsions. That's basically it. And then, of course, they need to go on for a period of time. They need to cause serious problems with your Lieben and your Arbeiten, with your, with your like, relationships and your school or work. Uh, so that's the basic stuff. An obsession is an unwanted thought. Um, we have common language versions of this, but the technical version is always a little different. And it's, it's more intense and more unforgiving. So an obsession is... Uh, a thought that keeps coming back that you can't get rid of, and it's intrusive. It's 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 difficult to make it stop. It takes effort to push it out of your head. It's not just like an idle musing. I wonder what would happen if I killed my roommates. No, it's more like you can't stop thinking about killing your roommates. Okay, that's an extreme example. Roommates relationships difficult. Anyway, um, so an obsession. Uh, obsessions are one of the main components of OCD, and some people with OCD have more um, have more obsessions and fewer compuls compuls compulsions, and others have the reverse pattern. Some have all of the above all the time. Uh, compulsions are behaviors that are very hard to stop. Now, these behaviors, it's not like they take over and your body is controlled like a robot, no, nothing like that. It's anxiety that's driving them, which is why OCD is usually still classified as an anxiety disorder. But uh, even though anxiety drives it, well, I'll tell you later, you know, throughout this lecture, I'll have some details about why it might not actually be best classified as an anxiety disorder. But uh, uh, it's anxiety that keeps these things going. You feel intense. You, you feel anxious, kind of freaking out. You might even have a panic attack if you don't do certain behaviors. And they kind of grow gradually over time. So they tend to be stereotyped and repetitive, which means, which, which leads people to call them rituals. That's a very common thing to call them. Common rituals are washing. So, but not just washing your hands, but like maybe having to wash your hands exactly 16 times and do it in, ver in groups of 16 or having to switch on and off the lights. So washing and checking are very common um, upset or sorry, compulsive rituals. Uh, touching or, or excessively grooming your body, like pulling out your hair, that symptom called trichotillomania is sometimes a, uh, an expression of OCD, sometimes not. Um, scraping scabs, biting nails, pulling skin, things like this. They can be uh, indications of this, but it's not just like a nervous, eh, eh, eh. it's more like systematic, and systematic is important. This is, all this stuff is related to perfectionism. It's a feeling that you have to do things exactly right, but the exactly right is arbitrary, and it becomes more arbitrary over time. It, it's irrational, and as you get older with OCD, you start to realize that it's irrational. So, it, it often results in poor school performance. You're distracted or you're missing school sometimes because you're performing rituals or because you are too anxious to leave the place where it's safe to, do, to perform your rituals or the obsessions are causing you to be distracted and not able to think about things. Um, and these, these things can be kept secret for a long time. They're not the kinds of things that we are particularly kind about judging as a society. Even the term anal. Uh, when I was in high school, we got the term anal we came from anal compulsive, the old theory, Sigmund Freud's theory, which is bunk. But he had this theory that, you know, at a certain age, you're obsessed with what's happening with your mouth. At a certain age, you're obsessed with what's happening with your anus. Well, during the anus period, if, you, if things go wrong, you can get fixated. And so you can either get super, like, obsessed, obsessed, I'm, now I'm using the term, like, you can get super excited and reinforced for <laughs> expelling things from your anus, so then you become anal expulsive, or holding things in, <sighs> clenching, and then you're anal retentive, and so Freud's theory suggested that if you 
um, learns to retain too much, like maybe you were punished or criticized too much for pooping in the wrong places when you were a kid, then later you're perfectionistic and you're retaining everything. You have to maintain tight control over everything in your life, so you're anal retentive. And then in the 80s, that turned into anal. It's a weird little intrusion from psychiatry, the Freudian psychiatry. Well, okay, Freud's theory about that was silly. That is not what happens. Uh, toilet training does not create OCD. Parenting, once again, blaming the moms is not what we should have been doing. Um, but these are things that we're not kind about. We're not gentle in the way we judge other people. The prevalence is about 1% by the time people hit adolescence. And it'll go a little higher than that, but a lot of the incidents happens up until adolescence, sometimes by early adulthood, but usually it's obvious by the time you're a teenager. <coughs> so um, for boys, the age is before puberty. The girl, For girls, the age is a little after puberty. And a disease that sets in before puberty has, it suggests different things about genetically where it's coming from than after puberty. So there, there are some suggestions just from that fact that perhaps it has some link to the Y chromosome and it might be a slightly genetically or, or sex linked disorder, although it's not restricted to boys. I mean, girls get OCD, boys are more likely to get it as I understand. The course of it changes over time, the contents of the obsessions and compuls compulsions. For little kids, the obsessions are very simple things, danger obsessions, um, I didn't do it right obsessions, I forgot to do this thing kind of obsessions. And then over time, as you get older and your brain gets more complex and you can think of abstract things, sometimes the obsessions are quite abstract. Uh, the, intensity, the intensity of this usually gets worse. And just in case I didn't explain this before, this is I have this half-assed theory. Although some other clinicians have this half-assed theory too. I'd like to see it explored though. Maybe it is. I should read all the research. Um, that being rich makes you more susceptible to OCD if you have the genetic component for it. Like if you have a strong genetic uh, sensitivity to it or tendency. So if you're, if you're wealthy, for instance, and a very common component of OCD, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, is contamination, dirt, germ, blood, you know, phobias. And it, and obsessions involving those things. Well, exposure therapy is how you deal with that. That's our most effective way of dealing with that so far. And if you're wealthy, you don't have to get to exposed to those things. You can basically buy your way out of them. You don't have to get a job. You don't have to work. You don't have to get dirty, etc. But let's say you know you grow up in the suburbs or you grow up in a somewhat poorer family and you have to get a job, let's say in high school, if you want to be able to get movie tickets and go with your friends every once in a while, or maybe even to help the family pay the bills. So you get a job, you're a high schooler, you're not gonna get like, you know, receptionist probably, maybe if you're lucky. Um, you might end up as a dishwasher, you might end up as a farm worker or something like that. You can't stay clean at those jobs. If you do, you're gonna get fired. So you get dirty every day and it's horrible. If you have OCD starting, it's gonna be like the worst thing ever, but you'll be forced to do it for long periods of time, which is an important part of exposure therapy. So your life becomes exposure therapy. This is my half-assed theory, by the way. I don't, I don't know of any journal articles that say this. And uh, your life can kind of help you be exposed to your anxieties. And so then the, the seriousness of the disorder is kept um, sort of minimized. Now, of course, if you have an extremely strong genetic loading for this, no matter what kind of job you have, no matter what kind of life you have, you're getting OCD. And even if it makes you lose your job, you've got OCD. It's, it can take over. I'm, so my half-assed theory only applies to kind of borderline cases that have some flexibility early on. And if you're wealthy, you don't have to be exposed to these things at all. The course can change quite a lot over time. Um, but one important component is that this is a lifelong disorder. We don't know of, well, with one exception, which I'll mention later, we don't know of any uh, expressions of this disorder that come and then they just get better and, they, and you just recover. In fact, without treatment, the most likely thing to happen is that these get worse and worse and worse until you finally go to treatment or you become sort of Howard Hughes living as a recluse, germ phobic, you know, it looks like you have agoraphobia, but in fact, you have germ phobia or dirt phobia, or you're doing your rituals all day, every day. Um, I am vaguely acquainted with a man in uh, somewhere north of here who has OCD, and he spends hours a day doing his rituals. Um, and there are really bad days when he misses work because he can't get all his rituals done, like checking and washing and checking again and washing and cleaning and stuff like that. So he'll get up at like five or six in the morning and do two or three hours of rituals. And then that's enough to get his anxiety down to a certain level. He can go to work, work all day, 
and then come home and do more rituals. And he doesn't have much of a life beyond that, is my understanding. At least, it, this was years ago I talked to him. Uh, he might have changed in various ways since then. So, like everything else, OCD symptoms are normal things that go wrong. It is adaptive to be able to do repetitive habit patterns. Always remember to turn off the lights when you leave the room. Always remember to check and make sure the fire is put out before you leave the cabin. You know, stuff like this. Always wash your hands. Ooh, lots of washing hands right now. Oh man, I wonder how the coronavirus thing is dealing with people who have OCD because hand washing and health and contamination fears are a huge issue. Oh my gosh, someone's got to be studying this. This is going to make some people with OCD just go critical. This is not good. I didn't even think about that until the second. Anyway, um, we all have these kinds of things. We, it's like our brain is prepared in some way to develop obsessions and compulsions on a low level that help us sort of navigate our lives. We're not great at all the critical thinking and putting all the details together all the time. So we have things like superstition and rules of thumb. Um, so don't step on cracks, don't walk under ladders, etc. And these kinds of things are very common in children who reach about, you know, second, third grade, because that seems to be about the time when some social development meets brain development meets, and, and then your brain is able to do abstract thinking. You're getting exposed to a lot of things via books and television and stories from other people. And so that's about the time superstitions really take off. Like my daughter, her, her teachers have, it's silly and fun. In the winter, they, they tell, teach them superstitious things they should do to try and get a snow day the next day. So when this forecast calls for snow, they tell them to, I don't even know what it is. What do you do for a snow day? Like put a sock under your pillow, put ice cubes in the toilet. It's all these crazy superstitious things and they love it. The kids just totally love it <laughs> and it's fun. But that age is the perfect age for that kind of thing because of where your brain is at. But people with OCD, it's gonna get worse and worse and it's not fun anymore. It's not, it's not really a joke anymore. Um, people with OCD tend to have a much higher preference for sameness than the general population. That's a variable that you can, uh, that you can look at. Let me see if I can, um, out. Uh, mouse pointer, mouse pen. There we go. So you can imagine preference for sameness on one end of a scale, and over here, preference for novelty, novelty. And you can have kind of a scale, a personality scale, and that is a personality dimension. So preference for sameness, sameness versus novelty. People with OCD tend to have much more extreme preference for sameness. I mean, it's kind of a normal distribution, right? Some people just can't stand to, to read the same book twice. Some people want to read the same book over and over and over again. You know, some people want to keep their house decorated the same way for 10 years. Some people redecorate it every five days. I mean, there are differences as far as that goes. But um, so that is part of the normal human experience. But people with OCD, one way to think of part of the symptoms is an extreme preference for sameness, like that dimension, whatever that is, just gets really exaggerated over here on this end over and over. Um, and routines. Routines are good for us in many ways. If you remember to do routines, then it helps us compensate for the fact that humans are not good at paying attention to detail, most of us. And so we do routines, like, like the pilot starting the airplane, you run through a checklist, like the doctor seeing a patient, you run through the checklist to see what to diagnose them with, right? So we've developed routines through, through our genetic and cultural history, but those routines can get super exaggerated in OCD. So as with everything else, if it's interfering with the important life domains. Now, what have I told you that the important life domains are? I'll pause and let you think. Leben and Arbeiten. Okay, the your relationships with other people, if it's making it difficult for you to have uh, satisfying relationships with people. And with kids, this is probably going to be caregivers, in many cases, parents. Um, and then maybe teachers and friends. And then Arbeiten, your work, your, your contributions to the world, to society, etc. And for kids, that'll just be school. So if it's messing up your relationships in school, that's a problem. The specific content can be of, of note. So we just know statistically that OCD is most likely to be centered around things like contamination, fears, um, checking and washing, things like that. And then the age and the suddenness of onset. Now this is relevant when you think of things like obsessive compulsive personality disorder, which is a very slow burn, long term type thing that um, has a lot of the characteristics of OCD, 
but is a personality disorder instead. So the comorbidity, comorbidity is quite high with other anxiety disorders, but also, and remember that graph we saw at the end of the last, at the last um, lecture, with depression. So that right there, the fact that the, com and you should see the numbers, but the fact that both of those are high comorbidities should suggest that maybe this isn't just an anxiety disorder, maybe it's something else. And so, I mean, if you have OCD here and it's got connections to other anxiety disorders and then it's got connections to depression, is that what's going on? Or is it more like anxiety disorders and OCD is one of them and then anxiety disorders in general have connections to depression? Which of these models is correct? Well. The pattern here suggests more this one a little bit, that OCD might be its own separate thing. I mean, it has strong ties to anxiety, but it has other characteristics as well. It also has ties to Tourette's, Tourette's syndrome and Tourette's disorder and the tics, the repetitiveness. You can imagine that that's maybe driven by a similar underlying biological situation. ADHD, um, conduct problems. So I'll, yeah, what that suggests is what I suggested in those little diagrams there. So the treatment is specialized CBT, exposure and response prevention. You expose the person to the thing that makes them anxious and then you prevent them from doing their response. The response is gonna be their rituals or avoidance. And the rituals are a way of avoiding. Rituals are a way of reducing your anxiety when you are experiencing that intense crawling anxiety that you, that you feel when you're exposed to whatever makes you anxious in OCD. The easiest kind, I think, of OCD to treat is the kind what is, that is almost completely manifest as dirt and contamination phobias because you can expose somebody to those things, as I've mentioned before. So I was working with kids, the little kid who, was, who stepped on the grass and thought it was poop, his final exposure was holding elephant poop in his hand. So, I mean, it was... Turns out, if you call a zoo and ask them for some elephant poop, they get really excited and they ask you how many truckloads you want. And I said, I just want a bucket full. And they were kind of disappointed. But his dad knew somebody at the Columbus Zoo. So he just called somebody. I called somebody. I just pulled up my little pickup and they shoveled a big five-gallon bucket of elephant poop. And that was more than we needed. Before that, I had been hunting around my neighborhood for dog poop. And I had been following people around, hoping to find the irresponsible people who didn't pick any up and had to steal their dog poop. Because um, we were doing exposure sessions with poop. And I just remember him just holding out a skinny little hand going, Why do I have to do this? Normal people don't have to do this. And I said, people who don't have OCD don't have to do this because they don't have OCD. But, man, the reduction in symptoms was intense. Before we started therapy, a family vacation got shut down because he thought he saw a piece of white something on the door handle of the family car. And, the, and they were going to take a road trip to Florida to visit family and have like a multi-week vacation. The whole vacation got shut down because he threw such a fit because he was sure that what was on the handle of the car was bird poop and there was no way he could get near a car that had any bird poop on it. It might not have actually been bird poop. It could have just been like a reflection or something. Anyway, after that, he was really pretty relaxed about things. I mean, he was still kind of an uptight kid. That's the way it goes with him. But uh, he was able to function. He went out with his friends. He did outdoors things, which was kind of impossible to imagine before this. Anyway, so it's the same special sauce as other anxiety treatments as exposure. And then you ride out that exposure. Remember the, the, I think I did this graph. Like this is your anxiety and this is time. You're exposed to the thing that is that, that you're anxious about. Oops, pressing the wrong keys. And you immediately get tons of anxiety and you need to ride it out until your body exhausts itself of adrenaline and cortisol and the stress hormones and this period of time here is always going to be about 20 minutes plus so you need to prevent escape during that and that's the art of therapy developing a relationship with somebody getting them on board with the program explaining what's going on and supporting them and helping them get through this without reassuring them i mean i just remember like, i'm not gonna lie to you it's probably poop um that was one of my prouder moments, as you can tell. So SSRIs actually help. And the fact that SSRIs are usually uh, prescribed for depression should tell you that 
maybe this is something having to do with what OCD is, that it might not just be a straight ahead anxiety disorder. Most anxiety is helped to some extent by SSRIs. My understanding is that at the time of me making this lecture anyway, there was evidence that SSRIs helped OCD more than they helped other anxiety disorders. The response was different. It's not clear how safe this is because SSRIs for children increase suicidality rates, statistically speaking. And so that's a terrifying thing. So that there's another way you can get OCD, and I'm going to kind of go through this quickly because I'm personally running out of time. There's only one webcam in the house right now. My computer crapped out, so we're sharing. Um, so for a very few children, you can get OCD because of a strep infection or possibly because of some other infection. And so this is the, the very general term for this is pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome, PANS. So this is you get some sort of something that makes it, hap it come on really fast and it's a neuropsychiatric syndrome which could be anything that's in the DSM-5 right or even other things but in this case it's usually used as I understand it to describe OCD like symptoms that happen for no reason that's all this means is like you're a kid and suddenly you get some symptoms for no reason um, but the thing that's the most common that happens with this is a much more specific thing. Now, whoever came up with this acronym deserves a medal. Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders Associated with Streptococcal Infection. PANDAS. Whoever did that, they're like, they're like the god of acronyms. It's amazing. So, um, streptococcal infections. So you get strep throat or you get various other infections that have streptococcus uh, bacteria that, that uh, are responsible for them. And then you get OCD like the next day or the next week, like immediate OCD. You're suddenly getting the obsessions of the checking and the contamination fears and the rituals and they just get worse and worse very fast. It's super intense, it's fast. Um, it's only about half of all the people who get diagnosed with OCD in general will be diagnosed with uh, one of these. And so, or sorry, not half, 5%, one in 20. And so 5% of the 1% of kids who will ever get OCD. This turns out to be 0.05% of all children, which is still about one in 2000, which if you remember that there's like 100 million kids in the United States, it's a lot of kids who are gonna get this, but it's still not ridiculously common. There's a lot of uncertainty in the estimates too that might change by the next time I write this lecture. Um, so you get OCD symptoms and then look at all this other stuff, all these other things. I'm not gonna go through them all. It's everything, almost. It's, it's a majority of the concerns that you have for psychiatric problems with kids. Pandas or pans sometimes comes with problems with eating, sleeping, growing anxiety, mood, depression, irritability, aggression, oppositional behaviors, attention, memory, and learning, hyperactivity, sensory motor problems, bedwetting, tics, or movements. Do not ask your doctor about pans. No, you should ask your doctor. Uh, so the prognosis really depends on treatment. If it doesn't get treated, okay, without treated, this is the scary thing. This can be permanent, and you can have an elevated, uh, like a permanently elevated risk of suicide because the symptoms are so nasty. Um, probably because of that. And then also, if you go on SSRIs, that makes it worse. Depression develops often as a result of this because suddenly you have horrible symptoms that make your life really hard to manage. Uh, but with treatment, um, the, high, the recovery rate is very high and the treatment is treatment for autoimmune disorders. So that's the interesting thing. You get, you, for regular OCD, medical treatment doesn't help that much. Uh, Anti-anxiety medications are not as effective as psychiatric or not psychiatric, psychological treatment like CBT, behavioral like response uh, exposure and response prevention, behavior therapy, right? But with this, medical treatment is absolutely the way to go. You fix the autoimmune disorder because so the current theory is that the the strep infection leads to this condition because your immune system basically freaks out and does all these unhelpful things. That's as far as I can go. I'm not an immunologist. Um, and so you treat autoimmune, the, similar to how you treat for things like lupus. So autoimmune treatment, you're giving people like uh, gamma globulin and a bunch of autoimmune treatment uh, regimens. And 
there's a very high recovery rate with this. So get it treated immediately. If you know anybody whose kids suddenly get OCD symptoms, get them to a doctor. And if that doctor is dismissing this, get them to a better doctor. All right, now we only have a brief amount of time to talk about PTSD and acute stress disorder. 15 minutes, is that enough time? Let's see what happens. If it isn't, we'll just, I'll just finish this lecture a little bit later and stitch it together. So PTSD, um, you need a traumatic event. Now, not just any traumatic event, like, oh my gosh, my D&D &D league got shut down, I'm traumatized. No, it, in general, we found that PTSD doesn't tend to happen unless there is a serious threat of death or, or serious harming injury to yourself or to others, and you experience fear, hopelessness, or horror. This is what's in the DSM, and it seems to be a pretty reasonable set of criteria as far as that goes. Now, the symptoms that you're gonna get are basically three groups of symptoms. Re-experiencing symptoms, avoidance and numbing symptoms, and increased arousal symptoms. Um, the trauma itself can't just be that you experience something horrible. There has to be that horror, that terror, that fear that horrible things could happen to you or to someone else. So car accidents, uh, rape, um, wartime traumas that happen, uh, these are very common. Natural disasters, they have to change your view of the life and of life and the world and a common theory about how we respond in all cases to this and therefore why some people with PTSD have a hard time adjusting is that our model of the world doesn't include the possibility of these particular kind of things for us and so we have to readjust that model and so some CBT has focused on trying to readjust that model um, it's less effective it seems important but exposure is what really does it once again but although this can be an important part of therapy so your former model of reality is inadequate and you need to integrate new information our brains usually do this and they say okay now i live in a world where i can get mugged or i can get beaten or somebody can get killed or something like that but sometimes we can't do this and our brains get stuck in a cycle where we can't get out of the cycle so here's a conceptual i'm traumatizing my daughter right now she's listening to this she could go in the other room, I suppose. But I'm done with the really scary stuff, I hope. So my conceptual model of PTSD is this. The terrible event happens, and then, okay, this isn't PTSD. This is how we normally adjust. Our brains are prepared to adjust to terrible things. It's terrible for a while, and then it gets better. So this is kind of what happens. We, we fluctuate back and forth between like the high activity, mental, physical activity stuff, like a generalized arousal and anxiety, and re-experiencing, which can be like nightmares, or feeling like you have to think about something over and over again or you just can't stop or it just keeps you keep having intrusive thoughts almost like in OCD about the thing that happened or avoidance and numbing where you don't think about it it feels like you kind of forgot to think about it like oh that's weird I was in a car accident two weeks ago and I haven't thought about that for two days how did that happen it was such a big thing it's pretty normal and numbing like emotional numbing it's also a symptom of depression but it's it's pretty common in PTSD so we go back and forth between these two extremes over and over again, but it gets uh, less in amplitude, probably not this beautifully regularly. It might be, you know, and then some spikes and some flare ups, and then, yeah. But over time, it is getting less intense. But with PTSD, it doesn't get less intense you get kind of stuck in a loop. Now there is definitely a genetic component to this overall anxiety proneness. However, it also has to do with the intensity of the trauma. Pretty much anybody could develop PTSD as far as we know if the if the horrible thing is bad enough. So the symptoms, we can think of them as being in three domains. Like we can think of them as being cognitive, so stuff you think about, behavioral, like behavioral avoidance, and then emotional and physiological, like the anxiety that you're feeling and the heightened heart rate and fight or flight response and stuff. And the core feature, as I mentioned before, are consistent re-experiencing physiological arousal. So sometimes it's not, a, not clear what it's from. Sometimes it's very clear that it's because you're thinking about the event or you had a dream or something like that. But sometimes it just happens and you're like, why am I constantly freaking out? Uh, having panic attacks even. And avoiding the associated stimuli so physically avoiding it, like if you're in a car accident, you avoid cars. Um, if you saw a shooting, you avoid public places, something like that. And then emotional numbing. So feeling like nothing matters. It's not a pleasant nothing matters, but it, it does seem to be sort of a, an adaptive response from our brains. In the PTS, in the DSM-5, um, the, 
they've kind of backed off. They don't like the whole vicarious trauma thing as much as DSM-4. DSM-4 was okay with it. DSM-5, there's been some controversy. Uh, there, there are limits to how much you can diagnose somebody with PTSD if they didn't actually experience the trauma. You can have, you can get it vicariously by learning what happened to somebody who's close to you. But in the DSM-4, you could get it by watching a terrifying movie. DSM-5 isn't going to let you get a diagnosis for that. And there's a controversy over this. The core, exp the core symptoms in the DSM-5 are exactly what the researchers have told us. So check it out. It's, it's pretty straightforward, what the research says. Now, as far as how frequent those symptoms are in children, avoidance is a big one. Remember I mentioned that avoidance is a big deal? Avoidance is big. It's also a good target for therapy. And then irritability. We've talked about that before, and there'll be a little bit more of that in our last lecture for the semester when we talk about depression and mood disorders. And remember that anxiety sometimes looks like irritability. It looks like being angry. It looks like aggression or curmudgeonliness or something like that. So um, the secondary symptoms, repetitive play, often reenacting the terrible thing that happened, refusing to go to school, increased fears in general, just overall increased anxiety, and feeling clingy or dependent, which makes sense. You want to stick around the people who are secure sources of safety for you. Um, and then you also have a different group of things like depression, survivor guilt, and decreased planning for the future, which is concerning. But it also might mean that you just feel like the world is an uncertain place and you can't plan. Like, how can I plan in this world where terrible things could happen? Um, I don't know why, especially on set of sleep there. It's, it's supposed to be those sleeping, um, sleeping things. So irritability, anger and aggression, anhedonia, poor school performance, and sleep disturbance, especially onset, onset of sleep. So you've got these different symptoms that, that pop up as secondary symptoms, but they're all pretty directly related to the PTSD to stuff that's happening. So the risk factors for developing PTSD, low social emotional functioning before the trauma. People who don't have a sophisticated or effective way of managing their feelings and managing social relationships before the functioning are at greater risk for PTSD, suggesting again this possibility that PTSD is largely about not being able to integrate information emotionally and cognitively. Um, a tendency to personalize the trauma, to, to feel like trauma is just about you and forget other people that it's about. Um, I mean, there are varying variants of this. Uh, and then this is really important, an escape avoidance coping style. I am a person who does this. I, I avoid and I escape. Well, this style of coping with difficulties doesn't help you fix the difficulties. Now, I'm gonna, not going to tell you it's a bad style. It helps, but it's probably much more healthy to deal with the difficulties and confront them head on and fix them or find some other way, use your resources, pull them together. Just avoiding and not refusing to think about it and escaping the situation, well, sometimes that breaks down like in PTSD, then the avoiding doesn't, doesn't fix it anymore. And then this is a big one, direct versus indirect exposure to trauma. So let's look at this chart here. This is um, a study, this is from a school shooting. And this, these are children who are involved and you've got over here, the people who developed PTSD symptoms and the, the over here are people who developed the disorder itself. So these are these subsets and looking at the, this kind of backwards way to look at stuff, but you're looking at the percentage of each group who had direct exposure or indirect exposure or no exposure. So you can see that direct exposure is absolutely the, the most strongly represented thing there. And there's lots of research that suggests this, that direct exposure is much worse than indirect exposure. Although you can get PTSD from indirect exposure as well. So uh, more risk factors, dysregulation of the HPA axis. Now we've talked about this briefly, but I'm gonna go through, I don't remember how much I talked about it earlier in the semester. You got your hypothalamus, which is up in your brain. You've got your, and your pituitary gland, which is also in your brain. And then you've got your adrenal cortex, which is way down like on your kidneys and your gut. Um, and that's where adrenaline and cortisol come from. So your hypothalamus sends signals, and the signal is a neurohormone called CRH, corticotropin-releasing hormone. Anyway, it's this, this hormone that gets sent within a few seconds to your pituitary gland in your brain, so that's pretty quick. And your pituitary gland then can, uh, it, it receives inputs from other places as well. It's not like it just automatically does this, but the hypothalamus receives inputs from your brain. What am I seeing? What am I feeling? What's going on? And then sometime, and then that, that modulates how much CRH it's sending to the anterior pituitary. The pituitary uses, you don't have to memorize what these are, by the way, but you should know what the, what the HPA axis is. 
the pituitary sends a different hormone, adrenocorticotropic hormone, which means the hormone that makes things change in the adrenal glands, sort of. Uh, so it sends this hormone through your body to your adrenal glands, which, like I said, are down like on your kidneys. And the adrenal, co the adrenal cortex down there, if it gets the right level of signal here, produces adrenaline and cortisol, both of which are heavily involved in fight or flight responses and make you feel a sense of anxiety and fear, and tension, and things like that. And then the amount of that stuff in your blood, which is where it's going, goes back and regulates, like the hypothalamus and the anterior, anterior pituitary, they produce less of these things when they sense, when they're getting information from specialized neurons that are sensing this, when they sense that this is happening. So you're regulating the certain amount of information that's in your, or of stress hormones that are in your blood. Well, people with a dysregulated um, HPA axis, one of the ways this can become dysregulated is you don't have a strong enough feedback loop there or this stuff is happening but the information isn't getting to one of these two places and so the hypothalamus just keeps producing the stress hormone and that pituitary keeps producing well the stress signal and the pituitary does as well and so then your adrenal cortex just keeps producing more and more you know stress hormones into your blood and these two guys are not responding the way they should and down regulating that so that's one of the things that can happen. And you can measure this in certain ways with people before they have a stress, and that's a, a huge risk factor. So the onset can be acute or delayed, and that's an interesting one, you should look that up. It doesn't, you don't have to get PTSD, I'm gonna see if I can wrap this up in a couple minutes. You don't have to get PTSD as just right this minute as soon as the trauma happened. The course is quite variable. Now, acute stress disorder, I'll just pause briefly to mention this. Wait, what just happened here? Okay, I was doing things that I wasn't supposed to be doing there. Okay, wrong window. Okay, acute stress disorder is just PTSD that hasn't gone on long enough to be called PTSD. So many cases of acute stress disorder will not develop into PTSD. So the big difference between PTSD and ASD is just the time period. And often you get a, a diagnosed with acute stress disorder right after an event, and then later, if it goes on long, long enough, you get a PTSD diagnosis. But some people won't get that diagnosed diagnosis, their bodies will regulate themselves and their minds will regulate themselves and their symptoms will start to get less. The ones who don't, they get a, a diagnosis of PTSD. About one third of children who are exposed to the kind of trauma that the DSM counts as a qualifying trauma will develop PTSD. And the course is quite variable. Often there's some reduction over time, but a buddy I knew in Texas, he worked in the VA system as a therapist for like 20 years. And he had therapists, he had clients in the late 90s, early 2000s, who were still in therapy for trauma that they had acquired in Vietnam. He always had something interesting to say about that. He would say the only people who were left in his particular experience in those groups were not the people whose buddies were killed in front of them, who were tortured by the Viet Cong, etc. They were the people who committed the atrocities. He, he was always very particular about that. He said those were the people who were still in the groups in his experience. The people who just had things done to them, they had uh, managed to reduce their symptoms and move on. The people who did the terrible things, he said that was actually more traumatizing. So the duration of that, uh, of the um, symptoms, seems most related to the type of stressor you experienced more than anything else, although it's going to be related to you personally and your anxiety proneness. And the severity seems to be related to two other things, the degree of exposure to the trauma, so more exposure to worse trauma, and your particular individual resilience. I can't just drop that there. That's like an entire world of study, studying individual resilience. It's way too much to deal with here. Anyway, some people are more resistant to developing mental disorders than others. Treatments, you should reject treatments immediately after the event, except maybe, maybe this one's okay. Maybe psychological first aid. Psychological first aid is just kind of, hey, what are your resources? Here are some things you can do. Here's some exercise to practice with deep breathing. Here's some, here's the crisis hotlines. Keep these with you. Here's a card for your wallet or your purse, whatever. Um, it's very hands-on, practical resources to deal with potential stuff. But this thing called debriefing, that's when you're put into a room often with other people, like a focus group, and people tell you that it's important that you talk through the thing that you just saw like an hour ago or something or earlier that day, that, there's a lot of research showing that that is a bad idea. People have been doing that since the late 70s, early 80s in various ways, and it re-traumatizes people, and it exposes people who didn't experience all the horrible aspects of this traumatic thing 
to the horrible aspects. It's very frequently done after like, you know, a shooting in a mall or a school or something like that, a natural disaster, an earthquake. It's not a good idea. People should not be doing this debriefing business. It does more harm than good, and it doesn't seem to help much. Um, longer term, trauma-focused CBT, and then EMDR with a really, really big asterisk there. So trauma-focused CBT is exposure therapy. It's, it's exposing people, so there's something called CPT. One version of this is called CPT, cognitive processing, processing therapy, and there are various other kinds. They're having you re- experience things um, by talking through them or CPT you're writing here's my pencil you're you're writing through them uh, that really totally looks like a pencil anyway so you're writing out your experiences over and over again a therapist guides you through writing out the details and it's not important to get all the details what's important is that you re-experience under control conditions in a safe environment while practicing relaxation exercises and stuff, it's exposure therapy. And so you have the same concerns. You want your exposure sessions to last like, you know, the 20 plus minutes. You want them to be increasing in intensity until you know, your symptoms start to reduce. EMDR is the thing where the eye movement, where you have a metronome or something and you're supposed to move your eyes and deal with stuff. Uh, the lady who invented it doesn't like this research because there is nothing special about EMDR. It's effective, though. If you have somebody who says, should I do EMDR? Say, yeah, do it, because it helps. But the eye movements don't matter. The eye movements don't seem to matter at all. They, they have nothing to do with it. They're, they're like, a, well, not nothing. They seem to be like a distraction, I've read, or they help um, to kind of soothe the person while they're doing this, whereas in CPT, then other stuff the therapy would, therapist would be doing or other kinds of exposure-based CBT, that's what would be reducing um, the anxiety enough to help a person stick with the process and do the exposure. Whereas for EMDR, the ritual of doing the eye movements and stuff seems to be part of it. So there's nothing special about EMDR. It's exposure therapy with um, a different way of focusing. And that is the end of this lecture. See how it says all done there? We're all done. And because I'm probably never in my life Gonna have this hairdo again. I'm just gonna like, there we go. This is the hairdo I should have done in high school, but I was way too conservative for that. I was like the good, I'm my hair, okay. Worst case scenario was a little top gun sometimes, a little flock of seagulls. All right, we're done with this lecture and I think maybe we only have one more for the semester. Thanks for joining me. That didn't stop. Thanks for joining me.